It's been a while since I last talked about 100 Years Quest, so how about I talk about the last six chapters all in one video. Now, this is a catch-all chapter by chapter, beat by beat review slash recap. I'm just going to talk about the main talking points, as it is primarily just fights, so I can get through them relatively quickly, so I can give my thoughts on everything that has occurred over the last two months in the world of Fairy Tale. It is also officially my first introduction to Fairy Tale Fridays, where I've actually got a couple of videos saved up, and I will be uploading one Fairy Tale video every Friday, whether it be my thoughts on current events in the manga, me talking about different characters, aspects of Fairy Tale that I like, aspects of Fairy Tale that I am not fond of, as well as theories and discussions on what could happen with the future of the series, and previous interactions with characters and events of the story that we all really love. So if you want to support the channel and see more of this, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell for updates on future videos. Really does help and ensures you guys enjoy the content I make here on the channel. I'm also doing YouTube memberships, so if you want to support the channel even more directly, go to the memberships. I'm going to be doing members-only videos once a month, members-only polls to help decide which members-only video, as well as early access to future videos of this channel that you guys can get access to about a week or even a month early, depending on the video. And I'm currently working on getting special stickers for channel members, so look forward to that in the near future. Now with that out of the way, let's get right into the video. And since a lot of these fights happen back to back, let's start off with Lucian Gray versus Genai Kotetsu and Sai. Now the last chapter, Lucy was turned into Brandish because of the Bond alchemy, and Gray was turned into Natsu. Now, I honestly knew that this would basically be more of an instant win for Lucy if she got used to using Brandish's power, and after a little bit of meandering around with trying to get used to that power, and Natsu and Grey struggling with everything and how to do their abilities, eventually Lucy accidentally turns giant, and then just decides to, you know, squish them with a fist, basically winning the fight instantly. And I also just like it's intercut with some comedic moments of Natsu trying to use his Dragon Slayer powers with Grey's ice magic with some comedic things leaving with just a big ice punch until he turns back to normal. So yeah, that fight was really quick, instant win for Lucy, because Brandish's power is actually really strong. So her kind of using it in a funny way, even though she kind of did the giant thing by accident, still ends off pretty fun. Gray did a fire make hammer thing, so that was fun, but fight's more or less uneventful. But I just like that at the end of it, Lucy is in a sexy cat maid outfit that Brandish made her to wear when they swapped bodies for a magazine so she can humiliate Lucy. Look, I find this funny. I do think that I it is a thing in fairy tale right now, Eden Zero, where Majima I think he's doing he's leaning a bit more into the fan service than he normally does, even though he does do a good amount of fan service throughout his st stories. But since this isn't part of the fight, I don't really have much of a problem with it. Moving on to the Sabretooth portion in Chapter 142, I like that we're seeing the Sabretooth guilds continuously not having luck with all the alchemy guilds in trying to find the Philosopher's Stone, and the only way they can really get it is Duke. And I like how they bring up, hey, let's just do the fa usual fairy tale thing and beat the crap out of them so that we can get information. But then the, the master of one of the alchemy guilds calls out to them, and after saying that he doesn't know about the, how to make the Philosopher's Stone, they point them in the direction of finding the alchemist known as Iroha. So whoever this person is will come into play later on down the road, and we cut back to wiz the wizard guild Magia Dragon, where Athena wakes up, stating that she has to destroy the fake duke, and also help the fairy tale guild. Even if it's reckless and Alephsir doesn't want her to do anything. And then Rogue and Frosh decide, look, I'm not going to stay in the sick bed here. I'm coming with you guys too. So they all end up getting transported to Gold Owl, which we'll see later down the road. After coming back to the aftermath of the fight, Gray and Lucy end up seeing that they're still stuck in this weird world, which is made by the Signario sisters, and thus they have to beat them in order to get out. Lucy, not wanting to be in that embarrassing dress, ends up going into her Virgo dress form, which I like better anyway. We then cut to Urza and Jalal having their interactions with Natsu starting his fight against Athena 2 again. And I like how he basically threatens Natsu by trying to kill Wendy. Let us take your magic, and then you I won't kill Wendy. And so Natsu begins to get thrashed by Athena 2, until eventually, when Natsu is about to get hit with a devastating blow and get his magic absorbed, the actual Athena shows up to save Natsu at the end of the day. 
which sets up another fight. This time being the battle between two Athenas, and then Natsu goes over to fight Duke one-on-one -on -one after landing a sucker punch. So, this fight begins in the background, and I like how Rogue stumbles upon the alchemy puppets that were left due to that mind trick that was placed on the guild members previously. Next up, the fight that I was really hyped for was Jalal versus God Serena. And so, the fight starts with Jalal getting his ass beat by Serena as he cycles through each and every single one of his Dragon Slayer magic abilities. The Sea Dragon, the Purgatory Flame Dragon, the Cavern Dragon, and then Jalal tries to land a Meteor, but God Serena then just throws him aside after getting hit, launching him down into the ground, and then uses his 8 Dragons Glorious Death Attack, launching 8 powerful Dragon Powers all at once onto Jalal, hitting him with a massive attack. But then Jalal ends up countering with a Grand Chariot on God Serena. But that doesn't really do anything. But in the middle of this attack, God Serena then unleashes his 8 Dragons Rampaging Fangs, as he then ends up devouring the Grand Chariot. And after that, he reveals he still has one dragon power he has left to use, which ends up being the Dark Dragon, and it grabs onto Jalal, as it's revealed that it exposes the person that is attacked by its sins until it's completely devoured. This transitioned us to 144 with a Jalal backstory, which I was not expecting. And this starts off with a funeral with Jalal's father, as he's standing with his mother. As he says, he'll learn magic and join the Magic Council, so that he can help his mother and people outside of their village. And this makes her, his mother very happy, but saying that her son is all she really needs to be happy. And Jalal just wants to be somebody that could protect his family. Transition to the cult of Zeref burning down his village and abducting people and eventually killing his mom right in front of him. As this puts him in a full-on despair downward, downward spiral as, as a slave, people are asking who his name is. He's about to say his name, which I didn't mention it. His actual name is is Seagrain, the seemingly fake name he made with his duplicate copy that infiltrated the Magic Council at the start of the series, was his actual name. And as we get this backstory, he's stating that Seagrain would be going to a magic school. He would get strong enough to protect his mother. He'd be admitted into a school in the city. He'd graduate out of his class and head for the council, and he'd basically be a member of the council. But after seeing his mother die, being a weak kid, unable to do anything... He basically says that he's not Seagrain, he's not the person that that was meant to be, and so he comes up with the name Jalal, thus creating a whole new different persona so he wouldn't have to deal with all of these negative impacting emotions. This actually adds another layer to Jalal going to the Magic Council, because that is something that he actively really wanted to do, but instead of going to help people... He kind of did it for his own selfish gains after being manipulated as a child. This also adds more to how he was so easily manipulated because Jalal went through full-on imposter syndrome going off to the, to the fact where he just more or less made it so he wasn't himself, he was somebody completely different. And with this more fragile mental state, it was probably fairly easy to manipulate this kid even more despite the fact of him being a kid. So this adds a lot onto Jalal. Actually making him a more well-rounded character. I liked this character before him, but this adds an entirely new level to it. So back in the present, God Serena is trying to make him suffer by succumbing to the weight of his own sins and be consumed by it. And thus he flashes back to all of the different things that he did as Jalal to Urza to the people at Heaven's Tower to Natsu to the R system, manipulating the Magic Council in his fight against Natsu. And those are his sins. He still feels guilty about all of that. And I like how we don't get redraws, but we get images from the original fairy tale manga in Mashima's original art style when he was drawing fairy tale. It's a nice touch whenever you get like flashback moments like this. You get to see how the art style changes. Even though this isn't Mashima drawing 100 Years Quest, it's still nice to see moments like this. Joel accepts the fact that his sins are never going to go away, but the darkness in his heart was illuminated by a scarlet light, aka Urza. And so he decided he wouldn't stray away from them again, and he made up his mind to move forward. As he gets himself off his feet, as the Dark Dragon disappears, he can pro proclaims that he is going to become a fairy tale wizard. Finally, the answer a lot of us have wanted since Urza brought it back up before this arc even started. Become a fairy tale wizard. I mean, Crime Star Zier isn't really fully needed anymore, so it makes sense that he would join fairy tale afterwards because he has a strong bond with Urza. That and the two of them obviously love each other, and I feel like this is literally another step forward 
into these two finally actually ending up together, ending a series long tease. Will it happen? I have no clue. Let's wait and see. But as Jalal gets back up, he is making Gatsurina a bit nervous seeing how the dragon's power is being purified. Obviously, Jalal accepts the fact that his sins won't go away, but he shouldn't be weighed down by them. At least that's what I'm getting from it. So, Gatsurina, after seeing Jalal getting ready to launch another attack, says, your attacks won't work on me. But after flashing back to Urza and saying that he has to repay the sentiment that she did, did for him by welcoming him into her family, something that Urza holds very precious above all others, he begins a new attack. Standing inside the seven stars, the nine stars pier that pierce the heavens as he creates a whole new magical attack, Orion, utterly hitting and decimating God Serena, burning him up, exposing the mechanical parts that he was that was used to recreate him with alchemy. And then out of nowhere, Jalal lands the finishing blow on God Serena in a similar fashion to how Acnologia killed the original God Serena. Some great irony that God Serena, who was dominating a fight previously, got so confident in himself, and he ended up losing. Very fitting, and I just like this callback. It's really cool. And it Kind of feels like a nice way for Godspring to get taken out. I knew Jalal would win, and I think bringing out a new attack was a good way to do so. And having a tie into him just accepting that he's committed crimes, but he can move forward. He doesn't have to be weighed down by all that anymore. I think it's good for his character. I wish this lasted at least one more chapter, and I do wish this for the next fight that we'll get into. But overall, I'm satisfied with the conclusion and it doing good for Jalal's character. I like Jalal's final lines to Godspring. You're already dead. Return to the netherworld quietly. I'll send you there. To a world without sin. I find that really cool. I like Jalal. Being a sinner is basically his character at this point. So it's nice to see him accept all that. And it kind of wrenches his character for me at least. So I wish it was like an extra chapter. But it is what it is. I'm fine with it. Now moving on to something that when this chapter came out I knew people didn't like. And that was Urza against the Signario sisters. Remember the Signario sisters? The characters that created this whole different space with alchemy that were giving Urza, Jalal, and Minerva a hard counter to their abilities some trouble before they could escape? Yeah? Well, we start this fight. Lusu engages Ur Urza by unleashing her alchemy, creating and warping the space around them to use objects to attack Urza one at a time. She then hits Urza with a jack-in-a-box, and then is about to crush Urza with a Iron Maiden-like plant. Urza requips into her adamantite armor to block it. But Aluso just gets excited and says, you know what, let me change that up. And just makes Urza wear a bikini. Thus allowing her to get hit by this attack, hitting her on the ground. Urza gets up and, re and begins to try and re-equip again. But is then hit with a boxing but bear that she created with alchemy. As Lusso is just basically singing and everything, being like, you know, I'm going to beat her here. I'm going to win. But Urza says, then I just need to destroy this world. Which obviously catches them by surprise as Urza requips into her heaven's wheel, scattered petals, and begins to launch multiple swords at everything in Lusso's world, destroying everything around her. Honestly, a pretty smart plan, but since it's something that Lusso can manipulate, Obviously, this stuff can be remade instantly shortly afterwards. Lusso just gets really upset and says, You can't possibly keep up with my world alchemy as she warps and twists everything around it as Urza just continues to destroy everything that she conjures up more and more. Urza does have some pretty strong, you know, destructive power. Obviously, Eni is telling Lusso to calm down, but she is getting very worked up as she continues to warp her world to use crazy world alchemy and isn't really thinking straight. So Urza continues to weave her way through all these nightmarish creations till she gets right in front of Lusso, as she then lands a devastating attack on Lusso, knocking her down and taking her out. Now, this instance, I saw people very upset about, and honestly, I can understand. I'm a little disappointed in this fact also. However, based on how we saw Lusso fight previously, she never fought herself. She just relied on her environment to fight her, meaning that she was more of a glass cannon. She could dish out a lot of damage, but she couldn't take it. There's also the added layer of the fact that she was getting obviously upset and was getting blinded by rage because Urza was destroying what she was creating. Very obvious because Eddie was trying to calm her down in that instance, and when you're in a blind rage, you don't tend to think clearly. So, yeah, I... 
it's a logical thing to go with Urza winning. I do feel like there was a much better way for her to win against someone that can manipulate space. If only she had an armor that could cut through space. Certainly not an armor that she has used once and only once in the entire series in the Grand Magic games against someone that could use space magic. Huh. I wonder what that could be. It's a Nakagami armor. I feel like there are so many instances where this armor could have come in clutch so many times, especially here. I was upset that she didn't use it against uh, Mika Mikasa in the Labyrinth arc because it was space type magic and Nakagami armor would cut right through that. This is a space alchemy, but since the armor can cut through space, I feel like it'd be very much welcome and I feel like we would accept it a lot more because it's a hard counter and you can use it to knock her out instantly. But I do like the fact that Urza used her Classic Heavens wheel armor to basically decimate everything, just use a bunch of swords to clear a path. Outside of the Grand Lucy one, which was funny, but not too big on action, this one is my least favorite, it's like my second least favorite. More of the fact that I feel like we could have done more with Urza, and the fact that these two characters gave three powerhouses trouble, uh, I feel like we could have done a bit more. But Urza fought this character before, and based on what she's seen, eh, she has more combat experience. She has, she's good with a fight, so I'll let it slide. But I feel we could have done a lot more with it. After her sister goes down, Annie gets enraged and literally twists the world into an even more nightmarish creation. As she just says, you know what, no more cheap tricks, I'm gonna fight you. As she changes her outfit, as Urza realizes that this doesn't seem to be alchemy, as Annie transforms into the armor of destruction using Requip, as it is the same magic as Urza, saying that she is a wizard. Bring us to the conclusion of this fight, which is chapter 146 in the most recent chapter of recording. Urza believes that this is magic and that she is a wizard, but Annie says that it is alchemy, alchemized armor. I mean, alchemy does technically tend to need some magic power for certain aspects, so you could say that she's a wizard. Either way, Urza's fighting a character with similar abilities to her, which I'm kind of surprised we haven't seen something like that so far. So, very interesting. The two of them begin to clash, and Urza changes into her Blackwing armor. And for a good number of pages, it is just clear-cut action. Urza and any clashing and pitting blows. Fighting seemingly evenly matched. Urza gets knocked away, she goes up, and any goes on to try and keep fighting her. The two of them are constantly clashing back and forth as Urza avoids attacks until eventually she gets hit by another one. Any goes in the distance and slashes Urza across the chest, seemingly knocking her down and winning. But after saying that you can't stand a chance against the Signario, her armor is also destroyed, revealing that Urza landed a blow at the exact same time. Showcasing that, in a sense, they're more evenly matched than they think. Also, any Signario is hot. Urza then asks the question of what they're planning, and basically, any states that they want to alchemize the world. They want to make it so that they want to kill all the dragons and make a world that's completely unprecedented through peace, where nobody would ever need to fear dragons again. And they need Athena to do so, to kill all the dragons around, you know, except for uh, Viernes, because he's a constant and not really a dragon anymore. But, you know, semantics. They say that they know what happened on Ishgar with Acnologia. Urza said that they did beat him, and that is true, but that doesn't mean the fact that just because they won, it doesn't mean that the existence itself left left a lot of misfortune and devastation. Urza states that it doesn't matter if what your cause is seemingly noble, you hurt my friends, I will never forgive you, and I'll cut you down. And I like how Urza responds to the fact that you would choose your friends over peace. Urza says, without the slightest, as my friends are what give me peace. As the two of them clash, and Urza lands a devastating blow, taking out Eni. Again, this was a good fight. I just felt like it could have lasted another half chapter, maybe another full chapter, seeing them go more back and forth, and Urza use another type of armor. But either way, it was still a good fight. It was nice to see two different people with the same abilities or similar abilities clash like this. And Urza did have a, have a good fight, so I'll leave it at that. And since she took out both Signario sisters, the alchemy world disappears and the group basically reconvenes in the middle of the uh, Gold Owl Guild Hall with Rogue. But it's then that Duke meets them, stating that they're too late, as he holds a beaten and bloodied unconscious Natsu by the head, stating, I've already gotten what I want. Ending the chapter on a really cool cliffhanger. It is honestly really cool to have a moment like this. Everything is going well. The fights are relatively short, and I know people have had complaints. But the fact that Natsu got off screen by a villain when he was being set up to have a one on one, and we don't even see it, is interesting. I feel like I should have. We, we are gonna cut back and see the fight, and then see how this happened, because stuff like that tends to happen. But there's also the question of what happened to Athena. Did she lose to the second Athena? 
or did she is it are they still locked in combat I have no clue but everyone aside from like Grey and Lucy are relatively exhausted from their previous fights so I doubt they're gonna take on a Duke that seemingly has no damage in a new Athena I'm curious to see how this is gonna play out overall these chapters were fun I enjoyed them I have my qualms with how things have gone with each of the fights being a bit too short but very Majima doesn't like doing too long fights but I feel like with these sections, I feel like we could have expanded a bit more, explored more with some of the alchemy being used by the opponents. The Gatsurin and Jala fight I liked, but I feel like it could have lasted a bit longer. Same with Urza's fight against the Zagnario sisters. Again, I will not let it go. I want the Nakagami armor back whenever she fights someone with space type powers, and it is a perfect counter. But personal bias aside, this cliffhanger gets me excited for what's going to happen next and how the guild is going to deal with Gold Owl, primarily Duke and the new Athena since they're seemingly the only ones still standing. Either way, I'm excited for the future chapters of Hunter's Quests. Again, I'm disappointed with how things turned out, but I'm fine with it. I still had fun reading them. And my favorite fight was probably the Jalal one due to the fact that it just added more to his character. Then it was the Urza fight, then the Grey and uh, Lucy fight. It was just kind of short and kind of funny. Nothing too serious. And the Natsu fight, I feel like we're going to get a piece of in like a brief flashback to see how this turned out. But those are my thoughts on 100 Years Quest in the recent chapters. What did you guys think? Leave your thoughts and opinions down below. And how do you think things are going to pan out from this point forward? Will they have to make another retreat with Natsu and figure out a new way to take out Duke and get their, everyone's magic back? Are they going to take on Duke right now and somehow someone's going to come in and help them take him down? Or is something else going to happen? Let me know in the comments down below as well as your thoughts on the chapters as a whole. And if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for updates on future videos. Really does help and it shows you guys enjoy the content I make here on the channel. And encourages me to keep making these videos for you guys. And with all that said and done, I hope you all have an awesome day.